This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israel's ambassador to the UN tells Gordon Robertson there are two United Nations concerning Israel, the private one and the public one. And Turkey's conquest in Ephraim sends Christians fleeing for their lives. Who will help? Plus, Faith Keepers, a Jewish plea for persecuted Christians. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danone, says there are two United Nations, a private one that admires Israel and a public one that votes against it. In an exclusive interview, Danone told CBN CEO Gordon Robertson about the changes that are taking place. Ambassador, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, let's start with your career. You've been the Israeli ambassador to the UN for three years. Have you noticed any changes in that time period? Well, first of all, the UN is a hostile territory for the Israeli ambassador. We still see a lot of hostility, but I feel the change. I feel the change, especially since Ambassador Haley stepped in a, a little bit more than a year ago, and we achieved a lot at the UN. What bothers me is that I see the difference between the public UN and the private UN. Privately, ambassadors will reach up to me, will tell me how much they appreciate Israel, even admire Israel. But then when it comes to public votes, we don't see it yet. My challenge is to close the gap between the private UN and the public UN. You've been trying to educate the UN ambassadors on Israel, on Judaism. You held the first Seder service in the history of the UN, uh, and you just finished an ex exhibit talking about the 3,000-year history of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Are you seeing a change in perception as a result of this? We do, and the best tool is to bring the ambassadors to Israel. So the exhibitions are great, the lectures are great. You know, we're having every year a seder at, at the UN. We tell them about the Jewish heritage. But once the ambassadors actually come to Israel, once they walk in the city of David, they get it. Do, do you ever find a point of irony that you, you walk into the UN, you see a scripture from Isaiah about beating swords into plowshares, and the UN has become a weapon against Israel? Uh, indeed. And I think the majority in the world wants the UN to deal with the positive issues. But unfortunately, the leaders who come here use the UN to attack Israel. Uh, and I think we can change it. We think the majority of the people in the world understand that Israel is not the problem. Israel is the solution. We, in uh, Judaism, we have a, a special value which is called in Hebrew, Tikkun Olam, to mm. repair the world. We believe we can help so many people around the world with agriculture technology, desalination, health issues, and we want to do it. That's why we hope that we will see that change coming soon. Why is that so prevalent in Israeli society? Uh, I've interviewed a lot of Israelis, and it seems to just instinctively come from them. We are to be a light to the nations. Uh, I, I find that unique. I don't find that in other cultures, that they identify themselves as we're here to help. Why, why is that? This is part of, of being Jews, to support others, to bring our knowledge to others. We see missions going from Israel to support communities all around the world. And I'm very hopeful because I think with the technology today, we have a lot of technology that will support the world. We will see that we have more friends around the world. What do you think of UNRWA? Right now, President Trump has said it's, his administration is going to withhold $360 million. Uh, and there are now publicized reports that UNRWA is going to run out of money by this summer. Uh, are you anticipating that? What, what are the ramifications of that? First, let's understand what the story with UNRWA is all about. In 1949, it was established to support the Palestinian refugees. And unfortunately, UNRWA, instead of supporting the refugees, they inciting against Israel. Look at the, the schools in UNRWA, the curriculum, what they are teaching the kids. So I think that the U.S. should consider what they're doing with their funds, with the taxpayers' money. They should support humanitarian causes, but they should not support incitement. There's talk that if UNRWA goes away, the Palestinian Authority will collapse. Uh, do you share that view? No, I think it is not the case. You have other agencies who can do that work. You know, UNRWA today will consider refugees, even people who live in the U.S., people who live in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, even those Palestinians who live in Ramallah, in under the Palestinian Authority control, they consider to be refugees. 
What do you think of the Taylor Force Act? Uh, it's gone through the House of Representatives. It's seemingly delayed at the U.S. Senate. Uh, and the act is designed to stop American taxpayer funds from paying for pay to slay and paying to reward terrorist acts against Israel. I hope it will go through because today Abu Mazen, President Abbas, is taking $340 million from the money he gets from the U.S. and other countries, and he gives it directly to terrorists who killed Israelis and Americans. I met uh, the parents of uh, Taylor Force only a week ago here in New York, and, and I told them that we salute to them, the way they speak and present the case of their brave son, and I hope that the reality will change and American taxpayers' money will not be used to support terrorism. Let's talk about politics within Israel, and you've gone on record saying uh, the two-state solution won't work. Do, do you still think that? I represent uh, the Israeli government. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said in numerous occasions that he is willing to negotiate with the Palestinians, to enter a room and negotiate, exactly the way we did with Jordan and with Egypt. Do you see that as realistic, uh, Anwar Sadat? It cost him his life. He was assassinated by the Muslim Brotherhood precisely because he made peace with Israel. Do you see any Palestinian leader surviving who actually gets to a negotiating table and says, I, I want to be serious about peace with Israel? We pray for peace every day, uh, and I'm optimistic. So today it's very hard to see it. And people are skeptical in Israel about finding a real partner among the Palestinians, but we have to be optimistic about it. Also, we have to take into consideration that Israel is a young country. Today, we celebrate only 70 years of independence. So maybe it will take another five years, another 10 years, but once we will find a real partner, we will be there, we will be willing to work together with them, the same way we did with the Egyptians and the Jordanians. What would you say would be the signs that they, they are really serious about doing that? Unfortunately, it is not the case. Take uh, Gaza, for example. We took out the entire Jewish community that lived in the Gaza Strip. I was against it back then in 2005. And look what happens there. Instead of developing agriculture, tourism, they build an entity of terror. They use the funds from the international community to build terror tunnels that threaten Israeli communities in the south. So you ask yourself, what, what is the goal of the Palestinians? And unfortunately, today, when we hear what they are saying in Arabic in the masks, they are not focused in building a society, hospitals, schools. They put all their energy to build measures to destroy Israel. Do you see any hope? We have to see hope. <laughs> we have to be optimistic. I know we have to, but do, do, you, do you actually see it? I do. You know, I, I'm a believer, and every day when I enter the UN and I, I see the, the hostility against Israel, you, you have to believe and to be optimistic. And when I walk in Israel and I see how much we achieved in short 70 years, I think we can achieve much more. So, yes, maybe it will take a few more years for our neighbors to come and, and speak with us. But when you look at what's happening today in Syria and Lebanon, I think even the people who live in those countries understand that one day they want to live peacefully with Israel because the option to live under radical regime is, is a bad option for them. You've got a platform right now where you're talking to um, hundreds of thousands of Christians in the United States and then an untold number around the world. What, what, what message do you have for them uh, as the Israeli ambassador? Speak up for Israel. We need you to stand with Israel, to pray for Israel, because many Israelis think that everybody is against us that uh, we have to make concessions to satisfy the world. I know it is not the case. So we, we need the supporters of Israel to be more, more vocal, to be more involved with what's happening in Israel. It is very important for us. We need that support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Up next, the Turkish conquest in Ephraim, Syria, sending Christians fleeing for their lives. Turkish troops have captured the Syrian city of Afrin near the Turkish border. And while the Turkish victory may seem minor, many believe it was a pivotal battle with major implications for the U.S. and Israel. When Turkish soldiers raised their flag in the center of the city, it marked the end of a two-month battle. Turkish President Recep Erdogan, who made capturing Afrin a major goal, celebrated the moment. 
The Turkish armed forces have established total control in Afrin's city center. Most of the terrorists had already turned tail and run away. The terrorists Erdogan referred to were Kurdish forces who fought alongside the United States in the battle against ISIS. From a strategic point of view, the Kurds of Syria have been the West's most faithful and indeed most effective allies in the course of the fighting against the Islamic State over the last three, three to four years. And there's now a very strong sense among the Kurds that they have in effect been betrayed by their Western friends and partners. Yet these Kurds promised to fight on and said their war against Turkey had entered a new phase. The battle saw the Turkish army fighting alongside Islamist groups, some of them Al-Qaeda militias. Some of these groups threatened the Kurds to either convert or die. Near the end of the Turkish campaign, this video was sent out as evidence of indiscriminate bombing against civilians. Churches in the area pleaded for help and prayer, while a UN representative warned of ethnic cleansing. At least 150,000 Kurds have now fled the area. Yet Erdogan mocked the European Union and dismissed attempts by the West to stop the offensive against the friend. There is nothing the European Parliament can say to Turkey, and whatever they say goes in one ear and comes out from the other. This is yet further indication uh, of the extent to which Turkey is moving away from its former role as a reliable Western ally and as a uh, NATO member in good standing, and more and more towards uh, a sense that Turkey is a state deeply tinged with uh, Islam Islamist uh, ideology. Many Christians, all of them former Muslims, feared a genocide as they saw radical Islamic groups on their way to Efrain. We spoke with one humanitarian aid worker who helped these Christians find a safe haven. As the battle over Efrain grew closer to the city, many Christians found themselves in grave danger. <laughs> This is a church service of the Christians crying out to God for deliverance as Turkish and Islamic forces drove towards Efrain. Charmaine Heading, the founder of the Shai Fund, helping the persecuted church in the Middle East, kept in touch with many of these Christians. A lot of information was coming to them that when these different people who came in who support this radical Islamic ideology that we've seen with ISIS and Al-Qaeda, that they would behead the Christians and they would kill them. And because many of these Christians uh, were originally Muslim background believers, they were particularly going to be targeted. CBN News has also learned of an added danger. Jihadists broke into the church, found pictures of some believers and distributed them. They're now hunting them down door to door. They say our situation is very dangerous and we don't know what to do because they found photos in the church building and he said they are searching for the believers now in Afrin. So he's the man, he's crying, uh, he don't know what to do, so we need really pray that God to protect him. Heading says most of the Christian families have found safe haven, but says the church in the West needs to pray for its fellow believers in distress. They should pray for their safety. They should pray that these families will be able to stay together because in these chronically desperate situations where masses of people are fleeing, families can get lost and little ones can get hurt. So we need to pray for these families that they'll be able to stay together. Kamal Sido of the Society for Threatened Peoples told CBN News the West needs to help. USA have, Christian have to help Kurds in North Syria as well in Turkey, Iraq and Iran. It's very, very important to support Kurdish people in this situation to protect Kurds because we need Kurds as uh, um, alias in the fighting against radical idea in Middle East. Heading says what is taking place in Afrin is ethnic cleansing on a massive scale. We know from what the statements that they've made that they want to get rid of the people in this area and bring in other people from Syria. So it's a population mm, yeah. displacement. Following the battle over Ifrin, many Middle East observers feel Turkey and these Islamic groups will continue to expand and try to conquer more territory. Coming up, faith keepers, a 
Jewish documentary on the genocide of Christians in the Middle East. Faith Keepers is a documentary produced by an Israeli organization called the Clarion Project about Christian persecution in the Middle East. Given the dire circumstances of the Christians in Ephraim, it's a very timely and important movie. Earlier I spoke with filmmaker Paula Kreskin and asked her why she made the film. Well, Paula, it's great to be with you here in, the, in our CBN studio. Thank you. Yeah. Faith Keepers is a, is a documentary you've done. Why did you do this? Why did you produce it and write it? And it's really been an incredible journey making this film, Faith Keepers. Um, a few years ago, I would say about three years ago, uh, I met an incredible woman, Juliana Tamarazi. Mm -hmm. She actually was in my previous film, Honor Diaries, and she's an Iraqi Christian woman who grew up in Iran. And she told me about the plight of her people, the Christian people in the Middle East. Even though I'm a human rights attorney by training, it's an issue I had really never heard about. I didn't realize just how persecuted the Christians are in the Middle East. And learning about her story, the story of Christians in Iraq and in Syria and all over the Middle East, it really woke me up to this idea that we need to do more for Christians in the Middle East and that it's a horrific human rights abuse, what's going on today. And, and as you did the movie, what did you find out? What did you discover? Actually, I mean, we started the film, we started shooting and producing the film before the rise of ISIS. And so as we were filming, that's when ISIS came on the scene. So whereas things for Christians were bad before ISIS, they took a horrific turn for the worse when ISIS appeared. Mm -hmm. And so I think just the absolute critical nature of this issue is something that I began to realize more and more. We're talking about the threat of extinction of Christians in the Middle East. And, and that was something you were unaware of. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I had no idea. I mean, I knew that Christians were an integral part of this region, the Middle East. I knew they'd been here for thousands of years, but I had no idea just how precarious their situation is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's so important that we made this film. We want to educate people and let them know about the critical nature of the situation of Christians and other minorities in the Middle East. A recent report came out about uh, the plight of the Christians or what Christians are experiencing here in the Middle East. What does that report say? Aid to the Church in Need came out with a report that said that it, now being a Christian is worse than at any time in history. Um, and I just find that startling, that to be a Christian is more dangerous than any time in history. And we see that happening all over the world. We've seen horrific bombings at churches in Egypt, in Pakistan, and all over the Middle East. And I just want the church to really wake up and hear the cry of their brothers and sisters all over the world and really take action. Moreover, what the experts are saying is that the extinction of Christians in Syria and Iraq is imminent. And so even though there are gains that have been made, unless there's a serious rebuilding effort and unless there's aid that gets to these communities, I'm afraid they're not going to survive. You're a Jewish woman. <clears throat> you did this about Christians. Yeah. What, what makes you really uh, passionate about this? Like I said, I'm a human rights lawyer and I really believe in the dignity of all people and the need to protect their rights. Um, certainly, I think just the Jewish experience having gone through the Holocaust and, and several mm. persecutions throughout history, I, I believe that it makes us a bit more sensitive to these issues and what's happened to Christians is a genocide and I wish people would use that word more. I wish people would understand just the severity of this issue. Uh, sometimes, at least I feel, there is a disconnect between what our brothers and sisters are happening, experiencing here in the Middle East and the, and the church in the West. Do you feel the same? I do and I, it's, it's a bit unfortunate because um, I'll speak sometimes to pastors and lay leaders in the U.S. and sometimes they'll say, well, you know, it's a bit of a downer. We don't really want to bring this issue into the church or, well, we don't really understand how this affects us. And I just I hope that they start to understand just how important this issue is. And even if something's a downer, it doesn't mean that the church shouldn't know about it. Um, and I, you know, the evangelical community in the U.S. did a, a tremendous job with human trafficking. Um, they took that issue and elevated it. And I want them to do the same with this issue as mm -hmm. well. And do you see any difference that uh, in the Obama administration for eight years and they were there when ISIS uh, rose up and now in the Trump administration? 
I have seen some positive shifts. I know that Vice President Pence has made some really powerful remarks about this, and I think the State Department is a little bit more open to the issue. Um, what I've heard on the ground is that all these promises of aid um, really need to get delivered. So, I mean, I would encourage viewers, you call your representative. It really does make a difference. Just make a phone call and say, hey, you know, we support aid going to Christian communities in the Middle East. If people are interested in the documentary, how can they find it and how can they see it? Yeah, so people should go to faithkeepersmovie.com and we're doing screenings in churches all over the country. And you can sign up to host a screening in your church and pray for the communities and get involved. And we've got tons of information on the website. Uh, so faithkeepersmovie.com. Mm -hmm. And where do you want to take this from here? You know, we released the film late last year and I really just want to continue to see it be a slow burn. I mean, a lot of times in Hollywood, movies come out, they're out for a couple months. I want this movie to be out for the next year where communities are showing the film, where we're building up and up, that we continue to bring this film to p the decision makers and leaders and just hear from communities. So I think we're just at the beginning of this film and I'm excited to be able to promote it. Well, Paula, kola kavod, as they say here in Israel, <laughs> with much respect, great job on this uh, film and I hope it uh, continues to be spreading around the church and the world. Thank you. Coming up, a preview of the Easter sunrise service at the Garden Tomb here in Jerusalem. Each year, hundreds of thousands of Christians from around the world visit the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. Many Christians believe it could be the garden and sepulcher of Joseph of Arimathea, where Jesus rose from the dead. For the seventh year, CBN News is partnering with the Garden Tomb on Resurrection Sunday to live stream the Easter sunrise service. Join us live at 6.30 a.m. local time for worship and praise and the Word of God as we celebrate that He is not in the tomb. As Christians proclaim on Easter, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And please join us in prayer for the protection of the persecution and even hunted Christians from Ephraim. That's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline. <music>